啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦啦
uh, was it different? Were you an intern for NBC and you would be a, like a jack of all trades for no. different programs or were you strictly? No, no, no. It, was, it was specifically for Letterman and, uh, and, and no, it was a coveted job. I knew that. Yeah. And I was determined to get it. And, uh, you know, there were, as there are still even today, there were must hires, people who were sort of the children of executives and uh, publicists and managers and movie stars. And, uh, and um, I knew that, that it was going to be a tough gig to get. And once I got there, I just sort of knew also, there were, I think there were 13 interns at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them sort of acted like they belonged there, which was sort of, um, I noticed that right away. And I was just determined to get a job at the end of my internship or at least a job offer. And, yep. and there was another guy, Donna Carey, who was an uh, intern with me there at the time. And the two of us were just like, okay, we're just gonna, everyone else is goofing off and acting like they belong there. We're gonna sort of uh, work our asses off and be there the first ones in the morning and the last ones at night. And, you know, um, if somebody pukes on the set, we will run over with a towel. Like, you know, and yep. we're not gonna pretend like we belong there. So yep. uh, that's sort of how we both, ended up getting job offers although the first internship ended and there were no job offers at all nobody left mm -hmm. so um both of us applied for another <laughs> internship which they didn't really do back then and uh we repeated our internships oh my god um, and that's then, awesome yeah and then donick ended up getting uh, hired by ed hall who was doing the photos um at the time yep and um and i ended up uh being uh, Madeline in, Madeline Swiftberg, I worked with her and she sort of gave me my first, she actually gave me my internship, but then um, I ended up being a researcher, which in okay. itself is, is one, of, one of the craziest stories of all time because, um, and I'll tell it to you if you want to hear it. I don't know whether- I, Absolutely, you know, no, of course. Are you kidding? Oh yeah, with that setup, you know, one of the greatest stories of all time. Do you, do you no, yeah, we'd love to hear that one. That'd well, be great. I mean, <laughs> on a personal level, not a, 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 not one of the greatest stories for anybody else, but, but, oh. but just from my own. But so what happened was that um, I didn't get a job offer and there were no job off openings there at all. Yep. And the one opening that happened was a talent researcher job. That was not an entry level job. Most of the entry level jobs were sort of answering telephones and so forth. Um, and and I'd been removed from phones. Um, I wasn't allowed to answer the phones as an intern. <laughs> and so uh, 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 I had made a joke, I guess. Do you know Shecky, Richard Checkman, who's a friend Very of well. mine now? Very well. So anyway, uh, he had a phone call one day and they asked if he was in. And I said, uh, I'll Shack. And he didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so i was uh sort of like removed from phones oh, no. like, I, you uh, I, I love shecky now and we're great friends but at the time like there was like people did not like interns to begin with and as i said a lot of people acted like they belong there right and i tried not to do that but i i sort of had that moment of uh weakness and um anyway i was removed <laughs> so the research position was um was coveted. It was, yes. everyone sort of saw that it was an entry level to producing and um, it was a big deal. And there were, I think, Morty told me later, like a, over a hundred submissions to be a uh, research, um, a researcher. Wow. And um, so that Friday, and this is before the internet and everything, they told you who we were gonna have to do a profile on and we all had to do profiles over the weekend and get them in. And, um, the profile that they gave us was Sammy Davis Jr. So I like beeline to the New York Public Library, got out his three autobiographies, yep. which are, I don't even know, yes, I can. They're all like 800 pages. It was sure. ridiculous. And um, yeah. so yeah. Uh, got them all, went home and just started devouring them. In the course of reading those, um, he mentioned being the, uh, the best man at Linda Lovelace's wedding, who was, you know, the big porn actress of the time. Yep. Um, and so I uh, remembered hearing that she had her own autobiography. And I was like, I wonder whether Sammy's in this. And I went to like in the West Village where I live, there was sort of a Wiccan witchcraft um, gay woman's store yep and i went in and got her uh her autobiography was there and i read it and the stuff in it was um 
really disturbing <laughs> about Sam Davis Jr. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Hugh Hefner and all these other people. And uh, I sort of, so I was like, well, how do I present this in here? Uh, so that, because Letterman, you know, he, he likes the humor to be above the belt. Sure. So I sort of, I sort of said, well, I'm putting this in his background. This is stuff I discovered and, and researched. And I did it sort of as delicately as I could. And, um, and I, I kind of had a feeling that I would be the only one who had that information. Yeah. And I knew Morty, Morty would also like it probably. So at the end of the, the process, Morty told me, you know, he's like, of all the submissions, yours was the best. Um, but there's a guy at the Today Show who's been trying to get this job for five years. And, and I'm, you know, I, we feel like we should give it to him. Yeah. And I was, you know, devastated by that and sort of went home and, and, um, and this has sort of been something I've tried to do my entire career, which is sort of advocate for myself, I guess, a little bit. Sure, absolutely. And I wrote a letter, I, I, you know, I wrote a letter to Morty and I, I sort of said to him, I go, you know, which would you rather have, um, you know, uh, an old tired researcher who's been doing it for years and never got ahead or somebody who's young and hungry, who's going to, you know, bust his ass for you yep. and, and I'll kill myself for this job. And, you know, I, I, anything I can do, you know, I, I really want this job. Right. And it was a Hail Mary. Yep. And uh, Morty called me. Yeah. Cause my internship ended and I went back to bartending. So Morty called me, you know, one thirty in the afternoon and I'd been bartending that night till five o'clock in the morning, New York bar stay open till four. Mm -hmm. And he woke me up at one thirty in the afternoon and he's like, am I waking you up? And I go, yeah, you are. Who is this kind of thing? And uh, <laughs> like, well, I was going to offer you a job, but now I don't think I want to. And I was like, no, please, I want the job. And he's like, what are you, why are you still asleep? It's like, oh, I'm still bartending. And uh, so uh, he offered me the job and uh, I got the job because of my uh, Lord Sammy Davis Jr. profile that well, I wrote. Tenacity. I love hearing that. I'm a big personal development guy. And, uh, and, and hearing that um, the advocating for yourself could not uh, endorse that statement enough. There are so many of us that just don't do that and going that extra yeah. mile, boy, you can, the opportunities and the doors that end up opening just for going that, for putting that effort out to go that extra mile, uh, a yeah. great, great example of that. Um, well, even today, like, you know, when I had our company, Josh, that we did with, you know, Sarah Silverman and Tim and Eric and Reggie Watts yeah. and Michael Sarah and Norm McDonald yeah. and Doug Benson, all these great comedians that we loved. And there were so many opportunities. And I remember we had like, you know, maybe a combination of 12 interns and PAs and people like that. And I called them into them at my office and I said, you know, I started like you, I had this opportunity like yourself and, um, uh, and you know, there's an opportunity here. And I want you to know that I'm, I'm happy to look at anything you write or any ideas you have and come into my office on, and I meant this and email me or whatever you want to be comfortable with. And, and it, you know, two people of, of the 12 people ever really took me up on it. And um, I know, and I don't blame them. I think people get intimidated or daunted by these moments and, you know, can't advocate for themselves. But I do feel like, you know, if you're willing to do it, I don't know. I mean, the other thing that happened that was really important to me and why I feel obviously an obligation to this day mm -hmm. to talk to people who are young and starting out. And, and I do it a couple of times a week, probably. Um, and this will probably end up inviting more people to do it, which is fine. Yeah, um, add me to the that, list because I'm, I'm one of those people, by the way. And you're, you're doing yeah. this is, is doing this for me as well. So the gratefulness that well, I feel for that is. I, I don't I don't ever say no. And, 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 and there's one person responsible for that. And there's another person, you know, which is Steve O'Donnell. Oh, wow. um, and, and Steve O'Donnell, when I was sort of a punk intern, um, I looked around and saw all these um, people who are writers on the show mm -hmm. and thought, well, I'm a, I'm a dramatic writer. I want to be a playwright. I, I bet I, I bet I could figure this out and crack this nut. So, <laughs> and it was, I, it was a very arrogant thing to think. I mean, this was the, these were the elite of the elite writers of comedy at the time. And Steve O'Donnell was a head writer. And I gave him my submission packet, which I still have. And it was fucking terrible. It was really <laughs> bad. And, um, uh, and, you know, a lot of those writers, not a lot, but a few of them were, were not very friendly. And Steve O'Donnell, who had the most coveted job in late night television or in television at the yep. time, yep. Um, you know, 
and and has to produce a show every single day. Not this wasn't like you know Chris Rock did won the Emmy every year and did like eight shows a year. Yep. This is you know two hundred shows a year and 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 the quality never can lower whatever. Mm -hmm. He took my packet and he said, "I'm going to take you to lunch." No gain for Steve O'Donnell on this at all. A nice guy thing. I didn't ask him to go to lunch. He said, I'm going to take you to lunch. We went to Sparrow. He went oh. through page by page with me, my material, and was encouraging, but also realistic. Yeah. And I never forgot that kindness that he showed me. And, and it's been my privilege to work with Steve on maybe six different shows since and, and, and hire him since then from Rosie O'Donnell to Bonnie Hunt to Norm MacDonald to The Man Show to Jimmy Kimmel Live. He has been an, an, an integral part of my career um, and, and, and my life. And uh, he's a guy that I love more than anyone. And it's, it all started with him showing me kindness at a really vulnerable time in my career. So I think uh, about it all the time. Well, I, I okay. So, uh, the way the way I got good at podcasting is I host a, a men's mental wellness podcast. My wife is building a thing, uh, an app about men's mental wellness, and she wants to she wants to change the world. And 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 the way that I'm helping, I'm staying out of her way. But I also host the podcast for it. And I'll tell you, uh, talking to all of these life coaches, personal development gurus, uh, filmmakers, athletes, coaches, all sorts of people, uh, uh, a gratefulness um, and kindness. Are, are the two silver bullets. And, and you talking about his yeah. kind of kindness is one of my favorite things in the whole world. I love kindness. And yeah. you talking about him and that act for you. I've had a bunch of people give me kindness while I've been doing this, you included in that list now. Um, and then if you can, if you can be aware of that kindness that happens to you, if you can spread it great. And then if you can spread the gratefulness and, and you talking about this X amount of years later and what it yeah. led to, I mean, would you have, yeah. I mean, how old were you when you were an intern? I mean, say it's 20, 21 like, years old. Early, you, early 20s. I mean, it was early 20s, yeah. To say the statement to, to 22 year old Daniel Kellison that you are going to work on a bunch of projects in the future with Steve O'Donnell and be a peer with him. Like, what would yeah. that kid have said? Like, that is crazy what you just talked about. Oh, That's amazing. No, and, 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 and that was it too. I mean, you know, it was so, um, unnatural that I was there it was not such a it was so not part of the plan and I wasn't a Harvard guy and I got into NYU into the general studies program which was sort of the remedial part of NYU uh, because my high school counselor knew somebody who worked there pretty much I got turned down from every college I applied to and 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 honestly that I could um, prosper at a place like that was beyond comprehension so that I took every opportunity I had to heart um, and, and, and did everything I could to succeed. And, but I also ended up being, that ended up sort of being my, the Peter principle, my, my calling was interviewing people and, and, and helping them come and tell stories in sort of an organic way that were funny and made them look good and made our hosts look good. And um, that was uh, really, I found that that was a, a skill set I had. So um, and, and, and part of it, I think part of it really was born from the fact that I, I've never been um, uncomfortable talking to anybody, be it presidents or Pavarotti or, you know, anybody. I've never been nervous about it. It's just not in my thing. And Letterman was amongst those. And I think a lot of people were really nervous talking to Dave yeah. and working with Dave and, um, and anxious about whether he liked something or not, which we all wanted his approval. But I don't think that I ever felt um, uncomfortable. And I think that, that he, I think the reason why I was able to prosper there with him is that, that I, to some extent, is that, that it was easy to talk. You know, I never asked anything of the guy. That was one thing, you know, I, and I just was happy. I was so happy to be there. So, you know, um, and I think I also made things, the things that I worked on, you know, went well and he trusted me you know and and so that was sort of how that worked also i think um i love I, I, I wish i could reword that but you get the gist of it no are you kidding me no no it was it was raw and real and i think i i think you yeah. worded it perfectly uh also yeah. you two are very similar in the in the in the fact that you know um the whole reason i started this show was inspiration from dave i didn't have the moment that he had 
uh, you know, in the communications class where he realized, oh, I can, I can do this. I didn't ever have that moment until I was in my forties. And, and, and it was the idea that he, uh, self-professed C student, you know, uh, again, but, yeah. but with that drive, no, you know what, I'm going to jump in my truck and drive from the Midwest to California. <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to crack that nut. I don't want to be a standout, but I'll learn the discipline because I know it's necessary because the comedy store is how you get to, you know, at that yeah. point, his goal, the ultimate broadcasting position. Um, yeah. Look at same, same thing. Like you guys are very similar in that regard. Uh, from a background, I mean, Kimmel, Kimmel's the same way too. Kimmel's not a stand-up comedian, and and you know he also was a broadcaster, but he totally, I mean, he idolized Dave, yeah, which is part of the reason why he and I became friends, Jimmy, in the first place, yeah. was because I had that connection, and uh, and and but but you know he had a similar path. He was not a stand-up comedian, and and so that was an extra hurdle for Jimmy Kimmel to clear. Yeah. You know? It's the same thing, and 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 sometimes learning those skills to have, uh, you know, for the bigger goal, um, you know, extremely important. I, I want to. I we could get in the weeds on this. Like, like literally, I could talk to you for hours about this. I wanna. I wanna uh, make sure that we get to some of the uh, the things that uh, that people are gonna want to talk about. Madonna. Yes, we're gonna talk about Madonna. Um, uh, but but other things as well. Now you get there for a while. You're doing the research thing. Old school, no internet. People don't understand that part of it. Yeah. Having to go to libraries, having to figure things out, make connections like that. Um, yeah. you know, there was an NBC library. There was something called Nexus Lexus at the time. And we paid for articles, you know, based on how many we wanted to print out. And there was a limit to how many they would let us print out. Yeah. That's a different time than it is right yeah. now. And, and people can't even, yeah. some people can't even fathom that. That's the reason we're doing the show is to, is yeah. to, is to pass on that torch and to pass on that knowledge to people. Yeah. Um, so you're doing that for a few years. Uh, did you stay as in the research department right until the end at NBC or had you already moved over to producing? At that I, I think I, I got promoted. So let's see. Um, I was a researcher and I used to provide all this sort of segment material to the producers. And that was, uh, you know, mostly Frank Gannon. And then, um, uh, and then I was also booking. I started booking some of the human interest guests and then some of the athletes. Um, and then I booked a human interest guest and it was, it was a big coup. And uh, from that, they, um, and I wrote an intro. The intros are such an important part for Dave. Mm. I wrote an intro that um, ended up being, I think the front page of New York News Day the next day. Holy smokes. Um, and, uh, and they let me start producing some segments from there. So, wow. Um, so what happened was there was a kid and, and, and again, it's such a cool story. I think is that, um, uh, remember when, and I don't know what, what year this was 91, maybe or 90 or 89, something Dan Quayle was the vice president. Yep. Uh, were, were maybe they were running for 1990, maybe it was 89, something like that. Okay. And, and, and uh, he went to this chalkboard and, and wrote the word potato. Yes. This kid, William Figueroa, did. And he wrote it correctly. It's a kid, you know? And, and then Dan Quill said, no, 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 and walked up and wrote an E at the end of potato. <laughs> and it was a, you know, a national scandal. Now, this kid, um, uh, William Figueroa, he ended up, um, every, he, everybody wanted to book him. You know, that was sort of the big booking, the big coup and the day we were going to get the station and Good Morning America. And uh, I had, um, you know, I used a tack that I didn't invent, but it was sort of like I'd heard legends of before, which is we de we delivered a pizza to his house. And uh, and in the pizza, I put a note saying, hey, uh, you know, I'm a nice guy. If you want to talk about this, we'd love to have you on kind of thing. And he agreed to do it. And because I got him as the booking, they let me write the segment. Um, and so I wrote the segment for William Figueroa and I wrote, you know, yesterday, uh, what did I write? So yesterday, um, our next guest walked up to the chalkboard, the events that followed terrified a nation. And, 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 um, and so the cover of the Newsday was terrifying a nation. It was a picture of quail and the kid from, uh, you know, the, the thing. But from that, and that went really well, 
they ended up letting me produce more and more segments. And that's where I got my foot in the door of the producer there, you know? Oh shit. That is fantastic. That's, that's lore. And that's the way I look at this anyway. And many of the people who, uh, who are in our community already, that's lore. I, I love that story. Um, okay. So yeah. So, so we're at the end of the run, but you still had a few years as a segment producer at NBC. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I think I was a segment producer at NBC, definitely, because by, by the time we went over to CBS, I was a segment producer, yeah. Um, talk a little bit about, okay, so so at that time, uh, there's a couple historic moments that I just feel I need to ask you about. You don't have to spend too much time on it if you don't want to, but at the end of the day, you were there when when Johnny came over from the up from the upfront meeting or whatever it was, yeah. and, and basically announced yeah. that he's going to retire, yeah. and then the the, the kickoff to the craziness, which had started behind the scenes before that, of course, that we've all read in, in, in Carter's books. But, uh, yeah. but I mean, that was kind of the, the, the firing gun for the public in a lot of ways. Uh, were you, were you there that night? Um, I was, I was not at the upfronts, but I was there, um, you know, on the show. And, and I think to this day, you know, um, I was still mad when Letterman did that Doritos commercial with Jay Leno with Oprah. I mean, I was like, I, 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 I don't bear many grudges. And it's funny, Jimmy Kimmel and I both, you know, bear a grudge against Jay Leno to this day, because yeah. this was the show that he dreamed of having Letterman and he was anointed by Johnny Carson and, and he was the chosen one. And what they did where they planted seed that NBC wanted to get rid of Johnny Carson to the yeah. point where Johnny Carson was humiliated. Uh, yep. This was his manager who did this, and 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 that he uh, retired, and then and then he shamelessly sort of lobbied around the country um, for that job. And I don't know, I don't think it was that special, as special as it was to Jay. I think it was just Jay wanting to, um, you know, compete. You yep. know. And uh, I just, I just thought it was the shittiest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I, I never, I didn't buy into the sort of like, hey, it's all, you know, it's fun and games, you know, it wasn't. And uh, no, it certainly wasn't, you know, and, and uh, so anyway, I still to this day, I mean, Adam Carolla, who's, you know, part of Jack Holden and Jim Kimmel is great friends with Jay Leno and yeah. Just I can't ever quite get over that. I don't think personally. <laughs> uh, I you know. I know what you're talking about. The tribalism within the Letterman community is still, uh, evident to this day, and uh, it's 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 a it's it's one of the scars uh, or or whatever you want to look at it uh, character spots um, in a story that that to me I think for me it's probably my number one uh, story in entertainment. Both Bill Carter's books, by the way, I'll throw this out to the audience. If uh, yeah. the Late Shift, incredible book, and then the War for Late Night, which was the sequel that we all had to endure uh, internationally, it was you know it was so it was so compelling. They just NBC decided to do it again. Um, yeah. and, and, uh, yeah. and, 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 but I mean, I can go deep on this subject too. And I, and I have, uh, uh but the, the idea though, it was the better deal for Dave to move over. I mean, he walked into the Carson deal where with ownership, um, I, that'll never happen again, where somebody gets to, unless, unless it's Kanye or Kim Kardashian or something crazy, no, no other group is going to own two hours on network primetime TV ever again. I don't think, uh, he walked into the Carson deal. Um, and, 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 and he wouldn't have had that if he would have taken over the tonight show. And then, uh, when, I don't think that was, I don't think that was the driving force. I think if you, if he'd no. been able to take the tonight show, he would have given up the ownership that he had. I, I, from, total yeah. agreement, total yeah. agreement, but hindsight being 2020, now we look back and yeah. we go, okay. The ironic part about it is he did what no one could ever yeah. do. And yeah. that was, of course, create a franchise that would compete with the Tonight Show in a major way. It, yeah. You know, talking about Jay, he's he his 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 standard. And I mean, I would talk to him, I, Mr. Leno. I respect all that, but I, I mean, his words of "Well, I came in number one and I left number one." You know, no, 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 not the point. <laughs> Nobody yeah. had ever con created a, a situation where you'd have to fall back to "I'm number one." It wasn't yeah. like that. No one had ever competed, much yeah. less, you know, and, and that's the achievement that Dave did. And he changed everything at that point. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I uh, wholeheartedly agree. 
Yeah. And well, you were there for that. it. You had a front seat yeah. for it. Like that's, that's amazing to me. And, and this yeah. is the, the beginning of your career, not the end of your career. You know, yeah. Hal Gurney's seen some shit. Speaking of Hal Gurney, I want to talk about Hal, Hal Gurney. Yeah. Uh, w- you know, when you went over to the man show, Hal Gurney came with you, right? Yeah. But, uh, well, I brought Hal Gurney over to the man show. I mean, Jimmy Kimmel was very excited to have anybody who was associated with Letterman and yeah. Hal's another person who I've loved throughout my whole career. And in fact, you know, here I'll tell you a story that I've never told before that you'll enjoy about Hal. Excellent. Um, uh, Hal, uh, so I got asked to um, executive produce Bonnie Hunt's show and um, and they'd had sort of a tumultuous year with telepictures uh, and telepictures I'd worked for for Rose O'Donnell and had been sort of, uh, I wouldn't say unceremoniously fired, I would say ceremoniously fired from that show. Um, and, and, uh, and so, I was surprised they called me back and asked me to EP it and it came in and uh, and it was really tough going. And and the guy, Jim Peritori, who rest in peace is mm-hmm. dead now, um, who really made my life difficult at Rosie. And then uh, he was at, at Bonnie with, and so anyway, yeah. they, um, uh, it was not going well with Bonnie and they sort of told me more or less that they were, you know, planning on not picking the show up but they had another year on the contract and, and wasn't good. Yeah. So I, I talked to Bonnie and, and, and rightfully she was unhappy with uh, how that was all going. I don't want to overshare on her behalf, but sure. um, one of the things that we talked about was getting a director in and she asked, do you think Hal Gurney would come in and direct? <laughs> now, Hal at this point was pretty much, his full-time job was walking around Ireland and Scotland and, um, and that's what he was doing. And so I called Hal and uh, I thought it was, this was sort of a, a fool's folly. I tried to talk him into, and this is something that, that you know, I think I can be good at sometimes is talking people into doing things they don't want to do. <laughs> um, and uh, I said, Hal, is there any world in which you would come in and, and, and direct Bonnie's show? I mean, maybe even just for a month, like let's get the ball rolling. And he said, I'll do it for a month. Here's what I need. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna need a I'm gonna need a suite at the Chateau Marmont, and I was like, okay, uh, <laughs> let me look into that. And he goes, and then he goes, do you know this guy Harvey Levin by any chance? And I go, Harvey Levin? I go, is that the guy from TMZ? <laughs> He's like, yeah, that's the guy from TMZ. Um, I also my other requirement is that that I have a meeting with Harvey Levin, and I go, <laughs> well. How you're in luck because Telepictures is our show. They do TMZ. I'll, I'll try to set that up for you. But do you mind me asking? You know, and by the way, the suite of the Chateau Marmont was five hundred dollars a night, and that was something we could do. So we, that was no problem. Sure. Hey, do you mind me asking why um, you want to meet Harvey Levin? And he goes, because I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him, man. I don't have much left, uh, much time left on this planet, but I'm going to do the world a favor and take him out. <laughs> Oh my God. Like, okay, well, let me see if I can uh, make that happen for you, Hal. I, I don't think that, you know, I don't think you're wrong here. So, uh, yeah. So, Hal came out. He never met Harvey Levin, to my knowledge, but he came out and worked with us for a month on Bond. <clears throat> so, we've traded two or three emails back with Hal uh, in the last couple of weeks here. And, and uh, I, I, I hope he wouldn't mind me telling that story. I don't think. No, God, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm certain he won't. I, I was yeah. going to ask you if you would mind me calling that yeah. back to him when he and I finally connect. That's what I was going to ask. Sure. <laughs> By the way, I think, these, I think these kind of conversations with Hal happen on the daily where yeah. he has sort of like these funny conversations with people. So I don't know whether he'll even remember it, but hopefully he will. Oh, that's great. That's but so I, I swear it's true. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, okay. So, so, um, Again, another thing Hal will tell you hours. is that we. Another thing Hal will tell you is that we, yeah. when we were at the Man Show, we we um, we were in a restaurant, and uh, we wanted to have a picture of all of us with Hal. Yeah. And we all decided to take our shirts off at the restaurant and thought that would be a funny picture. As one off. does, sure, yeah. At the fancy restaurant with our shirts off, and we all took our shirts off. And Hal tells me that is his singular show business regret that he never took his shirt off for that picture. <laughs> <laughs> We do. I still have the picture, and it is a great picture, and it's, and it's actually funnier because Hal has his shirt on, and everyone else has theirs off. But there you go. Oh, that is uh, that's fantastic. Eat your heart out, Bert Kreischer. Happened way before right. that. Um, 
Man, that's that's a fantastic story. I, I appreciate that so much. Hal was, as far as I'm concerned, uh, he was a cast member, uh, you know, director. Oh, yeah. Okay, fine, but character oh, yeah. in the show uh, oh, to yeah. no end. And and so he just, took, you know, here's the thing that he did that was was, and maybe I'm stating the obvious, but for people who don't know this, he would take um, a lull in the show, and he would just take the camera and like shoot somebody not wearing socks you know like and then it would break up the audience and it would bring it would give dave something to talk about kind of thing sure. like if somebody was sucking as a guest that yep. was a great thing to do you know or he cut away to somebody in the audience who's asleep or something you know like i mean he was really he was a big part of that show and he was the producer as well as a director and a creative writer as well yeah so, i mean he was integral to that and, well, and irreplaceable <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So I write about it that, you know, um, this moment here and, and, and how, uh, you know, this moment happens and it's the greatest thing in the world. Cause I'm doing an exchange with Dave. I made him fucking laugh, which is one of the greatest moments of my entire life. But then yeah. he goes back, comes out and immediately before he even starts the, the, the opening remarks monologue, before he starts the monologue, you know, calls back the conversation suddenly there's a shot of me in the audience laughing my ass off again uh yeah. and, and 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 it made the show that was even though i made dave laugh that was the dream come true because hal in my opinion for for those of us who are enthusiasts of letterman uh you know how badly did all of us want one of those moments where you could be the person in the audience that they cut to and that's how yeah. that did that that's how gurney that yeah. that made that happen yeah and 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 but the other thing you're talking about too, making Dave laugh and sort of, I mean, that was really so important to me. Um, uh, getting things that made the audience laugh and creating moments that got people talking about the show. That yeah. was, you know, that was what motivated me, you know, more than anything, you know. Well, well, shit, Dan. Uh, I don't know if you're a, if you've been in Hollywood and or you're a professional and you just know how to segue. But boy, oh boy, did you ever know how to segue? Let's talk about some of these moments okay. that you were the guy. Uh, okay, so segment producer Drew Barrymore. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Ma Madonna. By the way, I don't. By the way, the, the Drew Barrymore thing. You know, it's it's funny. I uh, <laughs> I will preface it only by saying it was a different time. And uh, <laughs> of course, and, and yes. And, yes. you know, and I think there's some context that's needed there because it wasn't just me, um, you know, browbeating a 19-year-old innocent girl to flash David Letterman. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like that at all. And, no. and what had happened was, um, you know, do you want me to tell that story? Or you want, are you going to go through a bunch? Or oh, no, no, no. Hey, to, no, please tell the story. Let's, let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. So with Drew, you know, there was this place in Tribeca um, and we, I lived downtown New York called Blue Angel. And um, it was really a unique place in that it wasn't a strip club. It was sort of a cabaret. And then like Parsons um, art school students were like, would take their clothes off in nuns outfits to Frank Zappa songs and dip candle wax on their naked bodies kind of things. And then there would be yep. cabaret acts and jokes yep. and things like that. Yep. And, you know, uh, Demi Moore, who was uh, researching striptease, this movie she was in, had told me about it. And I told Letterman about it and I'd gone and, uh, and you know, um, yeah. So anyway, yep. so I, I, I think I can tell this story. So I told, so Letterman one day, I told him about it. I'd been one night and it had been really like, you know, like being in Paris and seeing something that you don't see anywhere else. Absolutely, yep. And I said, I'm, I'm gonna go this Friday and, and if you wanna come along, you're welcome to. Now I meant that in sort of the way that, that Dave, you know, didn't go to the White House. He never went anywhere, but he lived down in Tribeca and so maybe it wasn't completely impossible. Sure. And I think that he was curious to see what the hell was going on in this place. And so he said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go with you. Yep. And um, I thought he was kidding. And um, he wow. said, I'll see you Friday at eight. I'll meet you at the bar, uh, Embassy Bar. Uh, which my buddy, uh, one of my great friends owned this bar and it was right around the corner from his house. So I went to the bar um, on the off chance and he wasn't there and I left. And um, I knew, I was like, this was stupid. Of course, he's not going to go to this. And sure. so um, he said that he went to the bar and uh, was swarmed by people because he never goes out anywhere. It was David Levin walking into a bar basically. Yeah. And, uh, and then what he said he happen? retreated and went home. And then, and at that but, but point, then, at that point, he's the hottest celebrity in America. Period. 
He's on Probably. Time Magazine. Yeah. He's on like yeah. he was he was yeah. gigantic to the gigantic at that point. Yeah. And and uh and so um Lori Diamond left messages on my answer machine going, Hey, you know, Dave's looking for you, but like it was before cell phones. So anyway, <laughs> I went back in. This this leads into the Drew Barrymore story a little bit. So Drew um is coming on the show and uh uh and what's interesting is the day before she comes on, she goes to this place, Blue Angel. And Drew, being the free spirit that she is, gets completely naked on the stage and, um, and has the time of her life. And it's the front page of the New York Post, but nobody had cameras, nobody had phone cameras. It was just a big story. Yep. And to her credit, she didn't cancel the show because everyone wants to talk to her about this insane moment where she takes all, all of her clothes at the strip club. Sure. And I'd produced her before. And she got on the phone with me, and um, this is before publicists listened in on everything. And she says, Dan, it was the most liberating experience of my life. I felt I've never felt freer. I've never been, you know, never felt better in my, you know, anything awesome. like that. And uh, uh, I, I loved every second of it. And um, I said, I've been there. It's a great thing. I tried to get, and so this context, I tried to get Dave to go one night. He got like, I, tried to talk him into it. He kind of half-heartedly decided, but he never made it. And she's like, oh my God, he would love it. And basically, um, you know, talking about her, you know, and I go, well, it's his birthday. Maybe we could give him a little performance kind of thing uh, of his own. And she's like, oh my, and now that, that's the part that's inappropriate on my part. I should never have said anything even resembling that. But she uh, said, through oh today's my God. lenses, maybe. But back then, at that time, let me just put the exclamation point on what you said. We're, we're Gen Xers. The Gen X culture at that point there, you think of the alternative culture and the music and all of these things. Like, yeah. it was a d very different time. Well, you say well, that it was, it was a time glasses. where people felt liberated by this stuff, and that was sort of the, the impetus Absolutely. for a lot of it. So, so she said, do you think he would like something like that? I was like, are you kidding? He doesn't get out. He would love something like that. She's like, well, how could we ever do that? I mean, you know, it would be really fun to do. So um, I said, well, you know, truthfully, if you flashed him, you know, you're back with the audience, somebody else would sing. And she's like, okay, I'm not sure I want to do this, but uh, let me think about it. I got to be working on my courage, and but it would be really fun. And why don't you just, you can't tell anybody. You can't tell Dave, you can't tell anyone. Um, it's going to have to be a surprise. And not only is it going to be a surprise, um, you know, but I might not do it, you know? Sure. So uh, just tell Paul to be ready with some vampy music for me if I need it. Yeah. Okay, great. I told Paul. So then I go and see Morty. And uh, Morty was uh, such a chicken shit at this moment. Morty was <laughs> mortified? Him, I've been wanting to say that no, forever. Was Morty mortified? Yeah, Morty mortified, yeah. No, so what happened was I said to Morty, I go, you know, I got this thing where, where you know, like, you can't tell Dave and you can't tell anybody. But, yeah. like, I know Dave. I mean, Dave is, you know pretty you know he doesn't like this kind of stuff and like i knew i wasn't gonna lose my job because i i, I figured you know i was okay with that stuff and i said what do you think and he goes it's your call and i go it's not my call you're the executive producer it's your call he goes your call danny he walks away from me I'm like fucking shit <laughs> so i was like okay great so uh I was like, fuck it, let's try it out. I yes. saw Drew went through the segment with her and uh, said, they're ready to go if you want to do it. And that's how it happened. Uh, you know, I, I, I use this analogy all the time. Carson's big band, Dave's rock and roll. That's a very rock and roll moment. I love that. Yeah. I, I fucking love that. I love that, uh, that you guys were, uh, you were so cool. Like, that's the other thing. Like, Drew, I talk about this, you know, kind of alternative nation at the time and the Gen Xers yeah. and who they were coming from. Drew was like the head of that movement. To have Drew on there, you were just, you were, and and then her to do that and make this moment that everybody talked about and is talking about 30 some odd years later, we're still talking about it. Well, now that's an incredible thing because when you do a show like that, where you're doing a new show every single day, those things, you know, I've seen yeah. it with Jimmy Kimmel, I've seen it with Dave, I've seen it with a lot of people. They don't remember if guests have been on the show in the past sometimes. Like, Absolutely. They don't, it's know, breakneck. It is. It is full throttle, yep. and and then you come up for air, and you're like, wait, what just happened? Twenty five years just went by. Kind of yeah, thing. you know. So well, yeah. that's the reason. That's the reason this show exists, by the way, because as far as I'm concerned, again, not to soundbite it, but the greatest body of broadcasting work in history, period, and most of it got thrown away, and the next day, and thrown away, and the next day, and thrown away, and the next day. 
And I'm sitting here, you know, 30 years later going, hold on, this is what makes up my DNA. We're going to pick yeah. some of those moments back up again. And the, and, and the, the big moments, of course, that's what we're talking about here. Hopefully we get you back on another time. We can talk about some of the smaller moments that people don't know, but to talk about the cool thing. And again, being conscious of your time, because I do want to get to Peter O'Toole because I love that story, but, um, but uh, Madonna. And I mean, okay. okay. So Drew Barrymore happens. Madonna's after that, right? Yeah. So with Madonna, you have to understand she is the biggest star in the world at that point. That's right. And also fodder every single evening for David Letterman for jokes. And because she keeps doing dumb shit and funny dumb shit, and uh, and it's really it's you know there's an endless amount of jokes about her to the but point she where talked I think, about she brought a clip did you help her get assemble the clip that well, she brought that night yes i did because so here's what happened so okay. um uh so yes she i think at a certain point realizes that she needs to probably go on the show um because it's every night and uh um she has a publicist at the, a manager at the time mm-hmm. um i can't remember Terrible, I can't remember her name. She was chair's manager too. Um, okay. Yeah, it's bad, I can't remember. Anyway, um, she calls up and uh, and we start talking about the possibility of Madonna coming on. Yeah. And so she goes, okay, I want you to talk to Madonna about this. So I get on the phone. So Dave is apprehensive about this and rightfully so. <laughs> rightfully so, yes. <laughs> and 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 um and I say, well, let me talk with her and see how this goes. And so I told her, I said, I have an idea of of how to have a segment that will make you look good, that'll be funny, that Dave will be comfortable with and will be comfortable with. And we can diffuse some of this stuff a little bit too. And the idea was. She can come on and basically say, you know, I've seen all the jokes you've been making about me. And um, and and Dave will sort of say, I, I've been making jokes about you or whatever he says, you know, like, I'm not, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then you say, well, I brought some clips. And you say, and there will be three pieces of tape and put him on the spot and let him sort of answer to each one of them. Let him be right? Dave, yeah, yeah. Right. So um, she likes that idea. So she agrees to the booking. And uh, I go to Dave and the night of the show, and I'm like, I actually think this is going to go okay. I think this is going to be fine. And um, (laughs) so uh, he goes, okay. I go, there's three pieces of videotape. She's going to call for them. We'll be in and out. And then whatever else happens is fine. Um, I go up to her dressing room and she's with a famous makeup guy, Kevin Aquine. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they appear to be stoned, but I don't want to say anything. I've never met her before. You mentioned Indo on the show. So right, I'll get to that too. Yes. So, okay, so okay, anyway, okay. Yeah, okay. no, no. So I, 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 so I, they appear to be something's going on. Okay. So I go, uh. I am Daniel, and she goes, and she puts it on her hand, and she goes, suck my dick. And I go, <laughs> I go, what? Like, I'm sort of smiling, like, I'm not, did she just say suck my dick? And I go, uh, okay, and she goes, suck my dick. And I'm like, and at that moment, I was like, oh, fuck. I don't know, I think I'm in trouble, and I think there's a different agenda going on here, maybe. <laughs> so I started, like, I started, like, my, my, you know, radar goes off and I'm like oh boy this could not this might not go well I really at that exact moment and so I tell her that it's three pieces of videotape and she's like that's too much for me to remember and I'm like it's not really too much so three pieces of video you just call from one one at a time kind of thing and she's like um uh and she says um you know well we had a little endo and I go endo, and I didn't know what the fuck. I mean, I saw pop, but I didn't know what I didn't know what endo or endo or what the fuck it sure. was. Sure. And then she and Kevin start laughing, and I'm like, oh fuck, she's stoned. So like it was like it was like, and I was like, how do you get fucking stoned in this? Like, you know, it's gonna be a seminal moment in television, right? And if you're nervous, <laughs> smoking pot is not the fucking thing to do, right? Like that's not it. Take a Valium. I mean, whatever. But you're sure. you're 
and she's almost like you know and going and she's like can i swear on this show and i go well i'll bleep you but you, i guess you can swear kind of thing so i did tell her she could swear you know and that's all she did she went out there and she tried to give Letterman her panties and she had a fucking agenda. She didn't call for the clips. And Letterman was not happy at all. Oh, I've heard. He was, and I was really, so here's the thing. It was two things. I was frustrated because I'd sort of presented it to Dave in a way that everything is going to be great and yep. it fucking was not great. Yeah. At the same time, I knew this was seminal television, no matter what happened. Absolutely. So, like, so, so you know, the, famous the or infamous, part, people were going to be talking about it, right? Famous or infamous, it, it, right? And yeah. the other part, uh, the other part of this was that 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 doesn't get talked about is that she wouldn't leave. She wouldn't get <laughs> off the set. The poor damn Counting Crows. The poor Counting well, so Crows. The county, right? The Counting Crows were making their national television debut that yes. Day. Yes. And we'd already bumped, I think we bumped somebody else in the middle, but maybe not. But anyway, we were about to have to bump the Counting Crows. She wouldn't leave. We kept trying to say goodbye to her on the air. And Morty said uh, to me, because I stood next to Morty during the segment, get, get rid of her. I'm like, how am I supposed to get rid of her? He's like, you just got to get rid of her. Because otherwise <laughs> we're going to have to bump the Counting Crows. So I went up to um, her and uh, and just sort of like hung out for a moment, like, awkwardly like a segment producer does and dave's for like not really talking to her and she starts in there and is like waves the audience madonna and she waves like this and i put on my hand and she takes my hand and i lift her out of the chair and i go wave again and i and i like i i literally escort her off the stage holy and, shit and there, there's a picture of that moment which i can send you later if you want yeah because it's, please it's me do. Push, me pushing her because the cbs photographer took the picture of the moment me kind of escorting her on the stage and Dave laughing his ass off because he just saw what I like. I'm dragging her off the stage. I'll send you the picture. It's a great picture. Um, okay, so uh, time is slippery. I, I I could talk to you about this forever. Um, yeah, my okay. very you favorite. My very I, favorite. I got my kid coming in any, any second, but it's so oh, bad. Amazing. Okay. Um, my my very favorite David Letterman moment of all time, and I've got a lot of them. But people ask me, "What's your very favorite moment?" Happened in that, and that was when she was calling him soft and all these things, and saying, "Oh, you've just gone soft, and you've you used to be really edgy, and now you're not." And he just looks at her with that smile and says, "I can spend that suspend that behavior tonight if you'd like." That's my favorite David Letterman <laughs> moment ever. I I love that, yeah. and that's yeah. you guys saying, "Oh, Dave, she's gonna do whatever she's gonna do. Dave's just gonna be Dave." That is uh, when, you know, we didn't pre-interview well, this. That is my very favorite yeah. moment of all time. And that was you guys saying, let's just let Dave be Dave. No, that was Dave saying, let Dave be Dave. And Dave was, so the way I always viewed these segment notes um, and, and the pre-interviews that I did was that they were a safety net for Dave in terms of if everything goes south and he doesn't have anything to talk to anybody about, they're there. And okay. frequently, you know, we'd be able to get some stuff that was interesting that he wanted to talk about, but there were also times when he just, you know, went off and didn't, or times like with Madonna where he couldn't go yeah. through the, what was in the segment. And then that was sort of, those were the moments where Dave was at his best, I think. And, you know, if you look at this sort of, you know, if, in, I remember TV Guide put together their sort of, uh, for Letterman Goodbye, their top 10 moments of Dave, as everybody did. I remember also looking at them and thinking, okay, eight out of 10 of these were unscripted. Eight out of 10 of these were moments born out of a spontaneous need Bingo. and, uh, and, and Dave's wit. And, yep. uh, and, and, uh, so, you know, it's interesting. We can all do what we do, but really like, you know, you live and die by your host yep. and, uh, and somebody who can be quick and, and, and funny like that. So, yeah. Well, and then you guys are the team that that, that guy, <clears throat> that genius relies on. And that's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. Very quickly, the next night, yeah. I think Chuck Groden comes on. And I, I mean, again, one of my favorite of all time. Did, now, yeah. did you produce that segment? Because if you watch Madonna, go to Giller's channel. Go to Giller's channel. We love the Don. Oh, the Don's, by the way, told me to say, uh, he told me to call you Kelly and say and, and say hi, Kelly, and give you regards. I'm thinking that he right. probably set me into a trap for that. So I'm going to say, hey, Kelly, Don says hi. There you go. I don't um, think anyone's ever called me Kelly, but I'll take it. <laughs> okay. So 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 watch on Don's channel. Watch, uh, or if they have it on, yeah. on, on the official Letterman channel, watch him in one of those yeah. two. Watch uh, the Madonna segment, and then look for the Charles Grodin segment the next night. Okay. 
because yeah. geniusly produced or just a couple of great minds who understood what to do. He comes on yeah. and does some of the same hijinks and, oh, what am I supposed to do and all that? Was that you? I don't remember. I, I think it might have been Mary Connolly and, uh, and, you know, but I don't remember. It might have been me and Mary together. We do stuff together, but I'll give all credit to Mary Connolly. Because okay. Mary Connolly gotcha. normally produced Charles Grodin. Um, they love each other. So gotcha. uh, I think it was Mary. Well, it was genius. It was the perfect uh, set spike continuation to the next day. Yeah. Um, before we get to Peter O'Toole, uh, there's yeah. so much. Oh, my God. I, we haven't talked about any Kimmel. We haven't talked about anything. I hope you come back. All right. I'll uh, come uh, back. Uh, I'll, you know, beautiful. I'll come back. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, sure. But I do want to talk about Norm Macdonald, and I and I, I call yeah. him Norm Macdonald because of because of uh, of, of yeah. uh, not just being a Canadian. I've I've seen him for years and all that. But but uh, you know he toured around locally, and 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 yeah. was, I just loved him so much. As I, we had Jeff Altman on yesterday, a stand up stand up Norm Macdonald, a stand up yeah. stand up. Um, yeah. You. Uh, when did you first meet Norm and the fact that you got to work with him and then now we've gotten this Netflix special that has just come out, which Dave, you yeah, know, was yeah. part of a panel and yeah. commented about it afterwards. Our yeah. hearts when it comes to Norm. Um, yeah. Let's let's can we can we can we go there a little bit? Yeah, of course. Um, Norm, uh, I, I met as a stand up comedian. And in fact, you know, while he gives uh, all credit to Adam Sandler for getting him on Saturday Night Live. Um, I called Jim Downey's office and talked to Tara Eli, who um, worked with Jim, and uh, and and said you you should see this guy. I mean, as a writer, largely first, yeah. And um, and then um, and he he'd done he was working with Roseanne, I think, also. Yeah. And uh, but he wanted to work at SNL, and but he like I said, he gives the credit to Sandler, which is fine. So anyway, he was. Uh, but Norm and I have known each other. Uh, our entire careers really and both of us and um so when i'll, I'll tell you um a story about norm that i love to, uh, i don't really i don't know if i've told it or not but i'll tell you um which is that uh, um when after i left letterman and then went to rosie o'donnell <clears throat> i was um on the sixth floor of nbc and i had this like unbelievable corner office you know for the christmas parties like you know mm -hmm. overlooking the rink yeah, on the sixth floor, and and Norm was on the eighth floor of the SNL at the time, and I and when Rosie was starting, I said like, hey, look, there's an opportunity here for you to, you know, this show's wildly popular. It's yep. especially popular with women, and um, you know, you should come on regularly because Rosie loves you, hmm. and um, and but he continued to be making fat jokes about Rosie to the point where Rosie was like, what the fuck, like. <laughs> What is with this guy and the fat jokes? So finally I go to Norm and I'm like, uh, dude, you gotta, I mean, I, I'm not gonna tell you what to do or not to do, but I think there's an opportunity for you to go on uh, the show and be a regular and Rosie likes you and maybe just give the fat jokes, you know, a few years now. Oh if, boy. If, 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 you, if you ever know anything about Norm, which is, he was such a contrarian that, that Anything you tell him to do, he's gonna do the opposite, no matter what it is. And and and, and it was too early for me to know that. I That's the OJ jokes on Weekend play. Update, right? That's the OJ jokes on Weekend Update. Yeah, he yep. wouldn't stop, <clears throat> yep. and it cost him his job. So he goes on Conan O'Brien's show the next night, and oh. he's talking about what a massive successful show Rosie is. He's never seen anything like it. And it seems like it's going to be nice. And oh, uh, and Conan oh. like he's like it. Conan's like it is. It's incredible. I've never seen anything like it either. She's on the cover of Newsweek. All this stuff. And 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 Norm says even when I came in there one day, there were flowers lined up all the hallway to her dressing room. And Conan goes, Yeah, I know. I know. And Norm goes, I didn't know you could eat flowers. <laughs> and and that was that. That was the end of Norm ever being on Rosie and all. And uh, that was sort of like the moment where it all sort of uh, came to a screeching halt. And I was like, I've tried. I'm sorry. And that was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. But, but I Norm, I, Norm and I, had, Norm and I, you know, one of the great uh, things I've done in my career was a show that 
barely got seen by anybody at the time, which yeah. was the podcast that we did at yeah. Jash, um, where we barely paid Norm anything. Uh, in the end, we could pay him a little something, which is great. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, it. my pitch Norm then was like, I don't think you've ever had a show where you've been able to be yourself and like be fucking as funny as you are without somebody trying to censor you or tell you you can't do something or can't say something. Yeah. And I want this to be that show because we're on the internet and it's the wild west and you can say whatever you want to say and I'm not going to censor you. You can, this is your, and that appealed to Norm. And it, that very first show, if you, if you watch it, it's uh, Super Dave. And I, we purposely came up with the idea of Super Dave on that show because it was such a train wreck going into it. We didn't have any, <laughs> I mean, we put up a wall and then we had somebody at Jazz set dress it, like an intern probably, and they sure. put clocks up everywhere. There were like 11 clocks. And, and I was like, what is the fucking clocks everywhere? And I'm like, let's leave it for Super Dave. He's like, no, no, you're right. Let's leave it for Super Dave. So like the whole show is Super Dave talking about, what the, where am I? What is going on? Norm, is it, what's going on? And it was like the funniest thing ever. But so, uh, uh, yeah, I was um, really happy uh, to you know, uh, spend a lot of my career with Norm, um, even as, um, you know, challenging as he was to work with. And, and he was certainly challenging. Anyone will tell you that. Uh, but but I, I knew he was a comedic genius. And, and that's sort of been my uh, MO my entire career is, is, you know, and as much as you're able to hook your wagon to, you know, whoever you believe in, in terms of their talent and, and, and you know, you'll look good. You know, yeah. that'll be, that's a good way to, build a career so norm was part of that and uh yeah i uh i appreciate you you uh opening up about that uh i mean i, I hate to ask this question but i feel like i wouldn't be yeah. good at what i do if i didn't ask this question did you know he yeah. was sick no yeah just like by the way not only did i know he was not knowing he was sick i feel i feel badly now because you know he 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 ended up we we now think or know that that he gained weight largely because of his i guess the steroids he was taking for the sure. cancer yeah and and everyone just thought he became a fat pig you know and there were, and he made the jokes that he was a fat pig now yeah and and to hide the cancer yeah on our podcast you come in with like a bucket of chicken and, and eat it you know comedically and <laughs> and and i feel bad now because i was laughing my ass off thinking he was just eating a lot and gaining weight and uh and and he was really it was pretty ingenious yeah. and it ended up being great comedy fodder um yeah but yeah that's what was going on in the pro wrestling world that's called uh living the gimmick and um <clears throat> he was living the gimmick i i i i uh i had a conversation a while back uh with with jimmy hart the mouth of the south um, and, and it was, we had him up here for an event for a charity event. And, and it was, it was cool because, uh, I got to be kind of his handler. Um, I, that was just my job was to take care of Jimmy. And yeah. all we did was talk about Andy Kaufman. We, I, I said, okay, yeah, we can talk wrestling. Great. <clears throat> I please, can we please talk about Andy Kaufman? And, and he yeah. was delighted. Oh yeah, Mike, we'll talk about Andy Kaufman. No problem. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I love him. And, and, and we went deep cause he spent months with Andy. And the yeah. idea of living the gimmick like that, Norm bringing the fried chicken in and, um, you know, trying to get this, to, to, to keep the fact that he didn't have cancer, he didn't want people to treat him different. The ironic thing is people are treating him differently because of the, the chicken and all that. Like, it's genius and well, it's I funny mean, he, and it's he endearing. took it further, which is that he would come in, <laughs> he, would, he would come in, he's like, I've got to lose weight. And he'd come in with this container of egg whites this disgusting container of egg whites and he pour them into a bowl and he'd microwave them for like three minutes and it was gelatinous disgusting and then he just squeeze ketchup all over it and he just started eating it like it was a normal thing and uh <laughs> and it was the most disgusting thing like it was and he get and he'd get it all over himself you know he's like oh this is terrible I'll just keep eating it and then drink coca-cola with it and you're like Jesus Christ, what the hell is he doing you know but i that was him again living the gimmick as you said you know um, well, as, as Dave you. would say right now, God bless Norm MacDonald. And, um, and we just appreciate, uh, him so much. Um, I, I want to be uh, conscious of your time. Uh, can you take us home with Peter O'Toole? Sure. 
and then uh, then everything will be till the next time. I can't thank you enough for this. Peter O'Toole, no. London, right? You guys taking the show yeah. to London? So here's what happened with Peter O'Toole. Um, you know, he was a great guest. He'd been on Letterman any number of times. And, and uh, he was always, you know, great. But I mean, it, 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 there becomes a challenge for a segment producer too. When somebody comes on a hundred times, Mm-hmm. There are only so many stories you can, you know, I mean, you're really like, you know, ring in the wash pot there a little bit. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, there'd be times with like guys like Tom Brokaw, who'd been on every sure. time we was a guest. Yep. Um, and so, you know, I remember as a researcher calling Yankee in South Dakota after reading his book, trying to find new stories in the book when most of the stories were we heard um and, and there was a big thing about repeating stories you didn't that was you didn't do that and even if they were talked about on other shows you couldn't repeat the stories that was part of the goal too so yeah um i'd call yankton south dakota and i found his school teacher and i found his neighbor and like they tell me stories and and tom was always like how did you find that out and like you know it was sort of a cool thing for me so peter O'Toole was a challenge so when i said to peter O'Toole on the phone and I had not produced them before. Somebody, I don't think I'd ever produced them before. Oh. These shows for us in London are a big deal. So here's what I'm thinking. Either you come out on a rope, like in my favorite year, like you make an entrance that way, or you come out on a camel, like Lawrence Arabia. <laughs> and, he, and so Peter O'Toole being, I don't know, in the 60s at this point, maybe you know, late 60s, um, yeah. said, uh, I am not coming out on a rope. <laughs> And I most certainly will not be coming out on a camel. And I said, oh, please, these are such big shows for us. It would mean so much. And, uh, you know, and, and I was begging him and, uh, you know, shamelessly begging him. And yeah. he said, I'll tell you what. If you find in London a racing camel, a real racing camel, I'll do it. But um, short of that, I'm not going to do it. And I go, OK, that's fair. I appreciate yep. that. I yep. watch, mark my words. I'm going to find a racing camel. I know the feeling. Now, I hear you. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I am, I, uh, uh, you know, we're in London. I'm looking everywhere for a fucking racing camel. I can't find a zoo <laughs> camel. I can't find anything. I can't find any camel at all. Um, but I find this guy and he claims to have a racing camel. I was like, God damn it. I knew, it. like, I was, we were doggedly looking forever and we found it. So got very excited, brought in the camel. And, uh, and Peter Tool shows up at the studios, um, Channel 4 Studios, and we have the elephant doors, the garage doors, that's where the camel is. And I meet him at his car, and I walk him to the, the loading dock, and I go, ta-da, racing camel. <laughs> and he goes, and he like turns up his nose, he goes, that is not a racing camel. That is a common zoo camel. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's the racing camel. He's like, no, it is not. Like, so like, <laughs> and uh, I'm like, oh no. And I think I spent like $5,000 or something to get this fucking stupid camel there. And then I had to get like, like approvals and a bunch of things. And like, oh, please, you still have to do it. Can you please come out on this? He's like, no, I'm not coming out. And I'm like, I'm going to lose my job. You have to make this entrance on this. And, and so he's like, he felt bad for me, I think, and he agreed to sort of do it, and he was sort of reluctant, and um, he goes, okay, well, we'll try it out in rehearsal kind of thing, and um, so then the part that that's sort of a cool add-on to the story is that we were doing stupid Patrick's that night, and I was pissed at the guy who'd sold me on the idea that this was a racing camel, and he was there with his camel, Yep. and I was pissed because I'd been fucking had and spent all this money on it kind of thing. Yep. And I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe this thing is salvageable. Does this camel do any tricks at all? Does it smile? Will it shake your hand? Does it wave its tail? Anything? He's like, nope, sorry, son, doesn't do any of that. Sorry. And then the guy's with who's with them says, enjoys a bit of lager every now and then. The camel does. I go, what? He's like, yeah, Here enjoys a bit of lager every now and then. I go, the, the camel drinks beer. Says yes. <laughs> I go, great. So I got an oil can, a Heineken or something yep. like, like that for Peter O'Toole. And as he dismounts the camel, after we did the rehearsal and everything, he says, I have a, what you call a stupid pet trick. And he opens it. And we haven't done this with the camel also. So maybe the camel was like, no. Camel takes the can, holds it up and chugs the whole thing. And the audience goes crazy, right? It was on the cover of this mag- British lad magazine called Loaded. It was on the cover of the magazine the next month. 
the camel with the can. Um, yeah, it was like, uh, it was, and then Peter O'Toole, of course, it just, it, it, it makes him, it adds to the legend status of Peter O'Toole. That he comes 100%. In the camel, and, and, the, and the camel drinks the beer, and it was a celebratory moment, and it was a great moment for me as a producer as well. Larger than life moment. Um, I'm probably forgetting a hundred details, but but that's what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for your time today. Uh, we're, we're, uh, again, the only reason why I'm not reminiscing more is because I want to be very, very uh, conscious of your time that you will come back. You said you'll come back. Thank you for that. We finished the show when we have a, a, a new guest on. Um, by asking the same question. So Dave, obviously, you know, you worship him the way that a lot of us do, the reverence that uh, we all have for him. Not that he'll ever know or care, but it's, it's, it's there. And, uh, I, I, and, and I, you know, yeah, I think, I think, I think if you keep doing this, I think over time, I think it'll, it, yeah, I think that it's a nice thing that you're doing. Oh, well, I appreciate you saying that. Um, <clears throat> it's uh yeah, I'm, I'm doing my dream job. I'm not getting paid for it. I don't care. I'm doing my dream job. And 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 yeah. this is the, the it's it doesn't feel like work, which is what a dream job is supposed to feel like. This is just amazing. Um, we finished the show by talking about we celebrate the fact that Dave has had so many different phases in his career and gone different places. Now he's doing the long long form kind of the Tom Snyder bit a little bit, but then interjecting video and things like that, making it really interesting for my next guest. I'm a big fan of it. Um, if yeah. there were three people that you would like to see Dave feature on my next guest with David Letterman, who would those three people be, Daniel? Oh, boy. That, that's, that's a question I'm not prepared for. And um, Off the cuff sometimes is best. I know. Huh. I'd love to watch him. You know, the people that I, I would like to see him with, I don't think he would, he would do anymore. But I loved and missed, and we don't live in a world today where it happens, his ability to um, take self-important people apart. And I would love to watch him interview Donald Trump today. Um, and I think he would do a really uh, outrageously good job with that. Because yeah. um, the guy that Donald Trump's so Teflon coated, you know, it's really, it's, it's tough to permeate that. So that would be one. Um, I'd love to see him interview his son, Harry. I think that would be endlessly oh, fascinating. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I would love that too. Um, and then who's the third person that I would like to see him interview? Uh, As you're thinking, Harry would be a really interesting answer because you you just mentioned being able to take somebody apart and and, and humanize them. Well, what more a person could humanize Dave than Harry? Because to, that's that's Dad, and it's not it's not Dave, it's Dad. And and everything that Dave talks about with their rapport and all that, he talks about how Harry can take a punch when it comes to jokes and things. And that I I would love that is a phenomenal answer right there for number two. I love that. Yeah, maybe I'll just stop on number two. Sure. Um, sure. Trump and Harry. <laughs> okay, well, I'll ask, uh, I'm going to ask this question then. Would okay. you like to see him interview Jay? No. Okay, there it is. Yep. I, you know what? Here's the thing. The same way that I didn't like seeing Trump being on Jimmy Fallon, yep. I don't like the idea of humanizing people that don't deserve to be humanized. Okay. In my opinion. And, and, and um, Jay was very conscious of what he did. And... Uh, and he did it like I'm a nice guy with a big smile, and I just never bought into it. I, you nope. know, that's just me. But but no, I have no oh, interest. Man, in no, that's not just you. There's a lot of folks in the uh, <laughs> in the Letterman community who feel exactly yeah. the same way and would probably go two or three steps stronger than that. So you're not the you know I I understand which is why I asked the question. Um, I think that that's a if there's a divisive question, uh, that that's probably within the Letterman community that that would probably be it. Right, and then I don't know who else did have him interview because i think he's interviewed everybody he wants to interview i mean i'd love to i guess you know i really enjoyed like you know when, when he talks to cardi b because they're they're both sort of fish out of water i love those sort of interviews yeah um, i think those are really fun to watch uh and i love how he sort of handles that stuff and then by the way i think that that you know as i still think he's the greatest talk show host ever absolutely but 
um, you know, it is interesting that he continues to evolve as a, as a talk show host, you know I mean? It's really, cause you think you can't get any better, but really like it's, it's, it's fun watching uh, the new show. Um, I really enjoy it. I really do. I do too. And uh, I just appreciate again, every phase uh, that he has been through, um, you know, from the morning show all the way oh, from, 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 from guesting on the tonight show all the way up. Uh, it's very, very nice. Uh, I use the phrase all the time. A fisherman can always recognize another fisherman. I appreciate the fact that, that, that um, we can talk about this and then we can take these thoughts and bring them out to uh, a very large Letterman community who is also very grateful that it's, I, I, I say, I've said this many times. I never thought that in 2022, I would say it's a good time to be a Letterman fan, but it is a really good time to be a Letterman fan right now. I, even though you worked with him and for him, went on to these big things that we'll talk about uh, uh, later on in other projects and stuff. I love seeing that you still have this, this reverence and adoration for him. Daniel, thank you so much for taking yeah. time to be here and to, and to open up a little bit, get vulnerable and talk about that stuff. I, I, it means the world to me that you do this. Thank you. It's, it's the pleasure has been mine and I appreciate it. And I appreciate that you're, you know, you know, you like Don Gill are sort of chronicling and sort of keeping, you know, uh, you're helping keep the uh, record. So it's, it's, it's a nice thing. Wow. I appreciate that. Uh, from your lips to God's ears, that's what we're going to do. Hey, there it is. Another episode of the Letterman podcast. Uh, we would just, all we ask humbly, uh, not even humbly, we'll do it abrasively. I'll ask you abrasively, please like this thing. Please subscribe to this thing. Please share this thing. God damn it. We're, uh, we got good things coming on. Uh, Rupert coming on here. We just got uh, one of the bridges. That we're Rupert build our for me. What's that? Say hello to Rupert for me also. Uh, I, absolutely. I, uh... Absolutely. I will. Um, yeah, and uh, we just got one of the bridges from the set. We're going to be building a new set in here for the for the the, the studio here. It's uh, lots of good things, lots of good guests coming. Uh, we are grateful to Daniel uh, for this. Has been another episode of the Letterman Podcast. Yeah. My name is Mike Chisholm. Thank you, and good night. Bye, Mike. Overcoat and underpants. <laughs>